Okay. So, my name is Stephen Johnson. I'm from One Mind for Research, and I'd uh, like to thank uh, Arte and uh, Duke Law School for putting on this conference. We are one of the sponsors, along with Kaufman. The interest of One Mind in this conference is uh, One Mind's focus on neuroscience and hastening cures in neuroscience, which involves both a focus on whether the correct incentives are there to uh, develop new cures for patients, and also looking at uh, where, or as part of that, looking at where intellectual property fits into the systems of incentives. So this afternoon's panel, I'm afraid, is, is a lawyer dance pack here. We have three lawyers of varying kinds, and the, the topic is uh, uh, the um, looking at the position of patents in the technology world uh, as compared to the pharmaceutical world. And by way of example, uh, actually, before I get into that, let me introduce uh, Phil Johnson, who is uh, Senior Vice President, Chief Intellectual Property Council of Johnson & Johnson, in charge of all intellectual property of all different types for the entire Johnson & Johnson group, and Gail Levine of Verizon, who is based here in Washington, I think, focused in large part on the policy aspects of intellectual property as they affect Verizon. Verizon, to its misfortune, is, is the subject of, of many lawsuits from uh, non-practicing ent entities, which gives um, Gail her particular focus. So just to, to compare and contrast two currently pending litigations, uh, right now in Illinois, there's a, a lawsuit involving a company called Innovatio, and Innovatio bought a portfolio of patents from Broadcom, which is a technology company based out in the Valley. Uh, they have asserted 23 patents against Wi-Fi routers made by companies like Cisco and so on. So here in this one lawsuit, uh, they've asserted 23 patents, but that's against the background of 3,000 other patents that uh, are, uh, for the purposes of the case, agreed to cover the particular technology of the Wi-Fi router. So that's uh, a litigation where in a sense, the judge had to use, has had to use statistics to determine the value applicable to uh, those patents. And uh, uh, he's actually determined that the royalty per chip, so per router, is under 10 cents per router, even though there are 23 patents covering it. Not to disparage the quality of the patents. They're made by a top quality pat um, technology company, Broadcom. That's where they're invented. But just the sheer number of patents covering a particular device means that no one patent can be all that valuable. There's only so much profit that could be attributed to each patent owner. Contrasting that, we have Alimta, which is a, a, company, a product developed by Eli Lilly, uh, where there's currently one patent in litigation, but that patent protects, I believe it's around $600 million of revenue in the US and around $2.6 billion uh, worldwide. Uh, that patent um, <coughs> has been the subject of a challenge under one of the pieces of legislation passed as part of what people call patent reform, the American Inventors Act. That challenge was, in fact, unsuccessful due to essentially it being filed too late. Um, but uh, that uh, trial has been held, and the decision from that trial, which will be apparently um, made in the new year will affect a huge proportion of Eli Lilly's drugs, drug sales. So the real question is, how, how do patents um, work? Uh, one system covering two completely different areas, one of thousands of, of patents per device and one of perhaps a single patent per drug. So let me just start with, with Gail and say, for Verizon, Gail, um, how do patents play into um, development decisions for Verizon in terms of new technologies you may adopt? Well, it's probably not exactly in the same way that many in this room will be familiar with from the pharma world. In our field, in the, and, I, and I don't want to speak for my company in particular, I'll speak instead because you don't care what one company's experience is. I can speak instead more broadly for uh, high-tech companies <clears throat> in general. In high tech for high-tech companies in general, um, patents uh, get more attention 
um, when they are asserted against you. Right? They're not often uh, uh, they're not often the one item that drives 2.6 billion dollars revenue worldwide, as as you'd said in that case. They're often uh, they often command attention when someone sues you for patent infringement, often on a patent on a, on a technology that you did not know was patented until you learned of it from the demand letter from the patent holder. So it, that the difference may arise from the fact that in different industries you have, like you were saying, different, a different ratio of patents per product to grossly oversimplify. You know, in, in some industries it's one patent per product, in another industry it might be thousands or hundreds of thousands of patents patented technologies asserted to have been, asserted to read on a product. If you're living in the latter universe, where you have hundreds of thousands of patents per product, you can see the vulnerability, right? The holder of any one of those patents, assume they're not, assume those patents are widely held. If the holder of any one of those hundreds of thousands of patents um, may believe it has a right to a fraction of your, your revenue stream, or maybe if they're feeling modest, a, a portion of your profit stream, but certainly a portion of your money, right? So in, in industries like that, one of the, one of the problems that uh, companies in the high-tech space have had to face is the problem of nuisance suits, right? So nuisance patent suits are the, that, the subclass of patent cases that are brought um, seeking uh, a fraction of the cost that it takes uh, to defend the lawsuit. How much are you going to have to pay your outside counsel to make the case go away? I'll take a fraction of that. Right? That's, what it, that's the classic definition of what a nuisance suit is. Um, and uh, let me be perfectly clear, this is not what happens in every patent case. I suspect you guys, in, if you all operate in an industry far different from mine, you may never see one and I and, I, and I'm glad you never will, right? Uh, you should not uh, look for them. Uh, but, in, but in some industries, I should say in some corners of some industries, some lawsuits do fall into that category of the nuisance patent lawsuit. So Congress was sort of aware of this problem and has been acting to address this in recent years, but maybe I will hold my thoughts about Congress and what, uh, what progress they're making to stop the problem of the patent suit for our later conversation. Thanks. So I'll now um, turn to Phil. So, Phil, the, the issue is that uh, in many <coughs> corners of industry, the patent is not the solution, but there's a feeling that the patent is a problem. And uh, so talk about the role of, of patents for Johnson & Johnson and also uh, what, may, what concerns you may have from uh, this uh, this feeling in, in other parts of the technology world that the patent is the problem, not the solution? Well, I think that people in the audience probably know the principal role of patents in the pharmaceutical industry, which is uh, they are the uh, primary vehicle that allows people to invest very large amounts of money in a very long uh, product development process and uh, there are only two legal uh, vehicles or that allow you or assure you that you're going to be able to recover your investment when you develop a new drug. One of them is regulatory exclusivity which only lasts five years and the other is whatever remaining term there is on a patent that would be found to be enforceable against the would-be generic entrant. So they play a, an extremely important role throughout the pharmaceutical industry because, uh, frankly, uh, drug candidates that don't have enforceable patent protection behind them are not developed. E promising ones, we've heard about it, some that are perhaps where the uh, drug was previously known and is off patent. Um, there was a, one of the speakers said there are all these drugs out there that could be repurposed. Why isn't anybody doing it? Well, the answer is if you're going to spend a billion dollars, and I agree it's probably much more than a billion dollars and 10 or 12 years developing a drug, the people who give you that money, and in our case, frankly, it's you all and your families 
and widows and retirement funds and so on to to take that money and spend a billion dollars or more to develop a product without some assurance that if it's successful you're going to be able to get it back not only get your money back but get enough additional money back in order to compensate your investors for having waited 10 or 12 or 14 years to do it and to cover all the other ones that you tried to develop and failed with um, th that takes something and if there's no patent protection as a practical matter when you run the numbers you can't get your money back and, and generate enough money out of five years of of data exclusivity of regulatory exclusivity so um, it's pivotal and, I, and what keeps me awake at night is thinking back to um, pr projects that I know of that uh, had very promising drug candidates that were not pursued on critical diseases because there wasn't sufficient protection for them. And that's a problem for all of us. Um, obviously, I could go on. Well, but the second half of your question was? I think, I've well, it. well it, it, let me actually just stop there and, and ask another question, which is, so, and going back to this morning's presentation, uh, for those um, who are looking at the, um, the slides from Bavin, uh, patents are a pretty perilous business. Um, you know, the statistics show that on average, um, you know, was it 40 percent of patents across all industries may be invalidated if it eventually gets to trial. Would you trade the um, uncertainty of the patent world? And would you make Gale's life better by, by sort of backing off the patent reform, by relying more and, and bargaining for longer data exclusivities? Uh, what, what are your feelings about the, the security and safety of, of a, of a longer term for data exclusivity as a reward for innovation? Well, we saw this morning a, a, another statistic, and that was this statistic of the success rate when an NCE patent, a new chemical entity patent, was involved. And if I saw this stat correctly, it was a 92% success rate, yeah. which um, is, not, is not uncertain. And in fact, it is so high, you may ask yourself, why are generic companies bringing cases when they have only an 8% chance of success? And one thing that's different in our industry from, from Gail's industry is that Hatch-Waxman, that is our government, is giving, in essence, a bounty to generic manufacturers to encourage them to challenge NCE patents and other patents on drugs in the form of 180 days of market exclusivity as the first generic who succeeds in those challenges. And that is so valuable to them that they can afford to bring suit after suit after suit with only an 8% success rate. So that's, I think, quite different. And I'm talking about bringing a suit that goes to completion, not just bringing a suit where they're going to back off uh, with a nuisance settlement. So that's, that's a sharp difference. But to answer your question, I will cite something that uh, we talked about last night at dinner, uh, and that's the regulatory exclusivity that was uh, given to to biologics, and in the law that was recently passed, it was 12 years, and I believe it took less than six months after that law was passed, offering 12 years before the president and the administration suggested a budget that was founded on moving that 12-year number to seven years. And so that suggested to some in the industry that um, a number that can be set at 12 can become seven, can become five, can become whatever. By contrast to patent law, which has as its advantage that it does, it's unified, a unified system covers everyone, but it's also <coughs> enshrined in uh, trade agreement after trade agreement, in world treaties, and um, we are subject to the TRIPS agreement 
um, which is international. And there, I would say it's not an understatement to say all of American business and the world economy is founded upon some agreement as to what patent protection is when that's not the case when it comes to regulatory data exclusivity. And, and I'll just echo one, one point about the differences between our industries. I think the, the, um, the difference in um, validity rates or invalidation rates between our two industries is, is, is quite important. When we talk, for example, in the high-tech world about a nuisance suit, Part of the concern is that the patent may well be invalid. It is likely questionable, right? It is not, um, I, I, I've never examined a, a pharma patent, but I have it on good authority that they are quite strong, uh, these the pharma patents. Not always true on the high tech side, not always true. And the, um, the possibility, sometimes some people say the strong possibility that the patent is quite open to <coughs> challenge as being invalid, um, drives some of the concern behind uh, the, the, the need to fix the nuisance suit problem. And we're not just making this stuff up. These were, this is um, the Federal Trade Commission about 10 years ago came out with a report, 2003, um, explaining the problem of the harms to competition and the harms to innovation. Uh, that stem from patents of questionable quality in the high-tech world. So, uh, Gail, right now we have uh, litigation pending, uh, a number of different bills before the, the um, Senate and House focused at so-called patent reform, generally focused at the, the, the issue of, of uh, lawsuits being brought against companies like Verizon. Um, could you just talk about what aspects of those um, proposed legislation, I don't want you to read tea leaves and, and suggest which will be passed, but say those which have broad support in the tech community. And then I'd just like Phil to, to, to comment on how those may have sort of unintended consequences if passed in, in the pharmaceutical world. Well, and I'm going to give your question <clears throat> a small tweak, if you don't Please. mind. Instead of talking about a bill that had broad, broad support in the yeah. high tech community, it's more interesting, I suspect, to most of America, what has what, a bill that has broad support in the House, right? right. Rather than uh, rather than what we think. Right. So excuse me one second. <clears throat> the House just passed um, this week by a, a, a um, 33 to five bipartisan margin, something called the Innovation Act. It was proposed by Representative Goodlatte, uh, uh, excuse me, the House did not pass it, the House Judiciary Committee voted it out of committee, pardon me. It goes to the floor, I, wishful thinking. Um, it goes to the floor shortly. Uh, at the same time, uh, Senator Leahy introduced his Patent Reform Act, so that will be uh, pending in the Senate. Um, what I, I can tell you a couple of you know, my favorite features of the the Innovation Act that the House Judiciary Committee reviewed this week, um, and they both go to this, this theme we've been talking about, this nuisance th suit theme. So one of them, for example, uh, requires genuine notice pleading. Um, today, when when a company like mine gets a complaint, some of them a, a patent complaint, usually it's from a non-practicing entity, but not always. Um, anyway, when, it, when you get a, a complaint from uh, a patent holder, um, sometimes they are quite precise telling you, in, in telling you what uh, patents they have, which claims of it are relevant, and how you infringe it, and why they think so. But not always. Uh, uh, here's just an example. We have, we, um, how many lawyers in the room? Outside counsel? Oh, no outside counsel. Great. This is a good story to say to that sort of maligns outside counsel. Um, we like to pay, we like to minimize our outside counsel costs, so we bid out our work. It, it's, they know this, but it, it's still, they don't like to hear it. So we, we bid out our work. Uh, and we hand off, we hand the same complaint to more than one law firm and ask, okay, here's the, here's the complaint. You can see from the complaint as much as I know about the suit, what would it cost you to defend us? In, in this lawsuit. And they come back with a number. 
we sent out one complaint to this law firm, and they came back and said, I'm going to have to do, charge you this much, roughly, because it's a complaint about your wireless product. And I sent it out to this law firm, and he came back to me with a different number and said, I have to charge you this much because it's a complaint about a wireline product. Right? We can't tell what we're accused of sometimes when we see these complaints. The, the, um, reform, the reform Act, the uh, Innovation Act, uh, patent reform bill fixes that, or at least attempts to, by trying to require a lot more specificity, so that when you get a complaint, you know what your, you know what, for example, you know what uh, you and your outside counsel know what you're engaging in, right? What, what's accused and why, and how can we go forward efficiently in this case? Another uh, important feature in the in the bill that was just voted out of committee is uh, a bill that um, determines when discovery happens. So you know, you, you, Markman is a word everyone here is more than familiar with, right? You know about Markman that, hearings? That's the part of a, of a patent case where the patent is actually interpreted so you know what you're dealing with in a sense. Mm -hmm. So in a Markman hearing, which is, happens routinely in these cases, the court tells you whether the patent, and remember in, in our case, sometimes the patents are not as precise right, as they might otherwise be. The court tells you that whether the patent you've been sued on is this big or this big. Right? After you learn that, your outside counsel and you can be much more efficient in directing the work of the case, the discovery that's needed in the case. If you've if the court, if before the court has told you the size of the rights captured by the patents, you might have spent a lot of time doing discovery out here in the margins that you learn after the court has ruled on Markman that the patent is only this big, is a waste of time, no waste of money. It's just not very efficient. So in order to enhance patent litigation efficiency, the, uh, the Innovation Act that the House committee just passed out this week attempts to address that. So those are a couple of my, my favorite features of the bill. George, good, neutral, bad bill. in the world of, sorry, George was a patent counsel at Hoffman LaRoche. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Phil. It's all right. Together, we're Johnson and Johnson. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are certainly um, beneficial parts of the bill that's been proposed. Um, and the bill, other parts of it remain subject to some debate because when you write legislation, you don't, you aren't sure what the impact is. Uh, one of the most controversial parts of the bill, I think, within the professional community is the degree to which the House Judiciary Committee feels comfortable uh, giving the courts instructions on a one-size-fits-all as to how the case is to be managed. Now, uh, Gail mentions uh, one approach which she has envisions applied to one type of case that's common for her in her industry. But there are hundreds of different kinds of patent cases that are out there maybe more than hundreds of different kinds and there may be cases in fact there are cases where uh, all discovery should not be stayed for a year to a year and a half while the briefing goes on to decide the appropriate scope of the claims consider for example just as one example a case where the actually the fight isn't about the scope of the claims it's about whether or not the defendant is the beneficiary of a patent license. The scope of the claims is irrelevant to that. Under the uh, House version, um, that party who wants to defend on the basis of a license may have to wait a year and a half, then start discovery and not get to the issue for perhaps three years into the case when efficient case management might have taken up the license issue initially, done a little focused discovery on it, and determined at the outset the principal issue. Another area that would be delayed in discovery is the amount of damages. There are, are two key issues in every patent case. One is, is there liability? And the second is, is there damages? Lots of times, parties can't settle cases until they know how much is at stake. You may know someone is making something and selling it, but you may have no idea how many of them they've made and sold and how much money might be involved in, in the damages. 
So now you may have to wait, in fact, you will have to wait under this proposal for a year and a half before you can start asking what the damages might be. And in a case where everyone might be able to look at the patent and assess the, li the likelihood of success on liability without knowing the damages, discovery, uh, which is delayed, may mean that it takes three or four years for a, uh, the patent matter to be resolved by settlement or, or otherwise. So there are many different views of um, the propriety of the provision as generally applied and of the approach of the bill to remove discretion from the district, the federal courts, especially the district courts, to treat cases one at a time according to the needs of the particular case. And that um, provision, I, I can't say that there won't be cases that according to the approach taken in the bill won't be helped. I can't say that improving notice pleading to a degree is inappropriate, but um, it, it's not entirely clear that there won't be unintended consequences. I will say that the Judiciary Committee has in many situations exempted Hatch-Waxman cases from provisions and including the provisions that, that were mentioned, um, I believe both of those provisions are uh, exempted from Hatch-Waxman cases. And why? Because there's a recognition in Hatch-Waxman cases that they're an entirely different kind of litigation under strict time requirements. And so to the extent that that's involved, that sh my comments shouldn't be overread as commenting on the, on the Hatch-Waxman cases. So you, that actually raises an interesting point. If, if Hatch-Waxman is carved out of the couple of provisions we've been talking about, is it a, do, would the provisions affect your industry in any serious way? Well, if all of my cases or all of our pharmaceutical cases were Hatch-Waxman, I suppose I would have to answer no. But the fact of the matter is that we have many cases that are involved both as plaintiffs and defendants um, where, that are not Hatch-Waxman cases. The, the pharma cases, but they're just not Hatch-Waxman cases? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of the case we had against Abbott where we got a judgment of $1.8 billion. In Texas. In, in Texas, mm -hmm. and that was, which was reversed, but that was not a Hatch-Waxman case. And you might have heard of the case Abbott had against us mm -hmm. on Stellara mm -hmm. with, where we prevailed at the district court. Mm -hmm. And there we have a lot of cases, and they're very important cases. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So thank you. I, I, at this stage, I think what we should do is because we're going to sort of follow on with, with a panel uh, immediately which, cut, which talks about alternative or additional incentives for drug development, just to, to steal a couple of, of minutes from the end of the day and ask whether anyone has any questions on this panel before moving to the next. Uh, for fear that um, people have to leave early or whatever. So if there are any questions for the lawyer dense pack, you know, now is the time to, uh, to ask them. Sure. Uh, I'm Sarab Vishnubhat, uh, and this is a question for, for both of you. The, the Goodlatte bill uh, that just made it out of judiciary uh, has also a provision on fee shifting that on its face is at least uh, technology neutral. And I was wondering if you would comment on how you think uh, going to a presumptively English rule with uh, the discretion for judges to decline to award uh, prevailing party fees only in unjust, uh, you know, where, where it would be unjust or if uh, exceptional circumstances warrant not awarding the fees, changing that presumption, how that would affect your industry. So um, that amendment was made on the floor. Uh, that's the wrong term, but it was made on the fly, right? Right at the last minute um, without a lot of advanced circulation of the language. But I think in the end, the language is, it's not quite all the way to a presumptively English rule. There's an exception for exceptional circumstances or unjust or something like that. And there's an exception for if your position was reasonably justified, right? I think something uh, like that. Reasonably justified in law and fact, yeah. yeah. Yes, in law and in fact, right. So. Um, I don't think we're all the way to an English rule, for better or for worse. It's just, you know, just, uh, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. It's really a variation on the American rule. That, that might be one way to think about it. I think the language is 
that the position and conduct were reasonably justified, which would allow the award in, the ca in cases of litigation misconduct. But um, in terms of how it affects our industry, it, and we're an international company, our industry is international, and everywhere else in the world we actually live under uh, the English rule. And so there are several ways of looking at it, but if you have mandatory fee shifting, which is common outside the United States, the question is, in the end, are you bringing or defending meritorious cases, or are you on the losing side more than you're on the winning side? And uh, so most, I think, multinational companies are who, who have sophisticated legal representation feel that they are going to win more than they're going to lose, so in the end they'll be better off. And um, so there's less discomfort, I think, within our industry, at least among multinationals, large multinationals, who have enough wherewithal so that they could sustain uh, fee awards. I think when you start working at the startup level and the small company level and the individual inventor level, you obviously start bringing in other concerns about that. And, uh, and nonetheless, those concerns don't necessarily cut against the provision because a small business or an in inventor may find that his patent, his or her patent is being infringed, but not substantially, so they might not be able to afford the expense of a litigation to collect a small amount of damages if fees aren't shifted, but if fees are shifted, it may switch the, uh, the calculus so that they will be able to bring cases because they, if they have a meritorious case, they'll not only get their damages, but they'll get reimbursed for their fees. So, um, but that being said, I totally agree with your characterization of it. This is not the English rule. This is a slightly relaxed American rule at best. That's probably right. And if, it, oh. and if you're interested in watching fee shifting in patent cases change this year, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear two cases, a pair of, I guess, somewhat related cases in, um, on, on, on fee shifting. Uh, so. Uh, I suppose you'll hear from Congress and the courts on the same question in short order. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank the panel very much. I, of course, being from England, just believe the English rule is great without any further analysis. But thank you, uh, Gail and Phil. Thank you. So we're now going to uh, reassemble our next panel with hopefully a seamless break. And... Uh,